So we're very happy to have uh, Tim Cohen, who's uh, well known to, to all of us. Uh, Tim got his PhD at University of Michigan, went on to Stanford, and uh, I forgot what he did after that, but he's, uh, he's now at University of Oregon. Uh, he's a, a, a former non-UC Davis postdoc, but uh, we love him anyway, and we're eager to hear what he has to say about uh, stochastic inflation at NNLO. Well, thanks, Marcus. Um, so uh, before I get started, um, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always a blast to come to Davis, even virtually. And um, I also want to tell you my setup here is pretty, uh, pretty nice, so I can see all of you. So if you feel like having your cameras on, that's great, because then it feels like I'm actually talking to people. Um, cool. So today, uh, I'm going to tell you a, a story that's um, something I've been working on with Dan Green for a few years now. Um, if, you, if you don't know Dan, he's, um, he's faculty now at uh, UC San Diego. Um, and he's really the expert here. He's a phenomenal um, cosmologist, field theorist, um, and uh, this you know whole set of projects. Uh, the, this line of research came from me asking him stupid questions about IR divergences in De Sitter, which surprisingly had uh, you know had certainly been studied, but um, I would say had not been sort of understood systematically, uh, certainly to our satisfaction. And a big part of what I hope to convince you of today is that uh, we have found the effective field theory for the low energy limit of modes and desitter. Um, so what I'll tell you about is um, a calculation that's in progress. We are uh, at the last stages of drafting. So I expect this will hit the archive next week uh, or maybe the week after um, paper with this title. And uh, what we've done here is we've taken the so-called stochastic inflation formalism uh, which I'll describe to you in a lot of detail, uh, which is one sort of viewpoint on the, um, on the IR properties of De Sitter space. Uh, and we've understood how to calculate corrections to that systematically using an effective field theory. Um, and we are now uh, world leading. Uh, we've computed the NNLO corrections and I'll explain how that power counting works, uh, required calculating a two loop diagram. And um, it also, uh, uh, as I'll highlight, is um, the first sign of non-Gaussianity uh, in this stochastic inflation formalism. So, you know, if you have the, the theory we're studying is uh, just phi to the fourth theory in De Sitter, massless phi to the fourth. And so you expect there to be some non-Gaussianity due to that self-interaction. And, uh, and we've calculated the first manifestation of that, um, as I'll show you. Okay. I should also highlight um, so, you know, Dan is the sort of senior person, but um, these two folks are in his group at UCSD. So um, Akil is uh, Dan's student. He is truly phenomenal. Uh, he's gonna be on the market this fall. So definitely keep an eye out for him. He's a um, field theorist with broad interests. Uh, I think actually you guys would have a blast with him. And I'll uh, mention at some point, a really heroic calculation that he did that he's gonna be writing up in a sort of uh, complimentary paper to the to the one we're about to post. And then Alec Ridgway, uh, who's also great, he's a postdoc in Dan's group um, at UCSD. Okay, um, so I kind of have two goals with this talk. Uh, the first is I just want to tell you uh, some, some new ideas about the infrared limit of quantum field theory and De Sitter space. Um, and in particular, I want to try to convince you that there is a simple effective field theory description, follows all of the standard rules of effective field theory with a couple of nice, uh, interesting twists. Okay, and I don't have to convince any of you, when we have a good effective field theory, we get answers to important conceptual questions like, you know, what are the degrees of freedom? What are the equations of motion that govern dynamics? What are the symmetries uh, that persist in the infrared and so on? Okay, and of course, EFT also has important practical applications, which is that it organizes operators for us. Um, as I'll argue, in this EFT framework, we actually have a natural regulator that um, that's quite nice to work with and re respects symmetries and power counting, um, and it lets us sum IR logarithms using the renormalization group. Okay. So um, everything we love about EFT is going to play a role in this talk. Um, and by the sort of sheer virtue of 
it being a, a well-defined, honest to God, local EFT, uh, I hope to convince you of sort of the correctness and the power of this approach. Um, and the setting uh, we're gonna use uh, is this idea from Starobinsky from the mid eighties of stochastic inflation. Okay, so Starobinsky basically understood this description of the microscopic uh, aspects of De Sitter, basically uh, trying to understand the probability distribution for uh, the modes that as they cross the horizon. And he recognized there were basically two competing bits of physics that he had to account for. The first is this so-called drift, which is simply the fact that this uh, massless scalar field lives in a put on a potential. And so it's going to fall. If it's excited up the potential, it'll fall back down. So he called that drift. And then he also identified a quantum noise effect, which is basically just the order Hubble fluctuations of the quantum field as the field crosses the horizon and those modes freeze out. And that quantum noise can jiggle you up or down the potential, but gives you a sort of motive force to drive you up the potential. So that gives these two competing effects. You've got this quantum noise moving you up and down the potential, and then this friction or drift term that's, that's pulling you back down, okay? Um, and Starobinsky argued that this naturally leads to, oh, I'm, I misspelled this. This is back when I didn't know how to spell Fokker-Planck. This should be a K. Fokker-Planck equation. Um, and, uh, and so the Fokker-Planck equation describes the time dependence of the probability um, distribution of this field phi. And it has these two terms. So the quantum noise manifests here as this two derivative term with respect to phi proportional to Hubble, right? Because that's setting the rate for the quantum noise. And then there's this term here, which is accounting for the drift. It depends on the derivative of the potential, OK? So this, by the way, this Fokker-Planck equation is uh, even famous to phenomenologists. Um, this is the equation that you solve, for example, if you want to check the metastability of the Higgs in the standard model. So when the Higgs was discovered, there were these beautiful papers um, that came out of uh, the CERN group where they computed, um, essentially, they took the NNLO uh, uh, Coleman-Weinberg potential, stuck it into this formalism, and uh, and we I think we've all seen these plots. They're very famous um, of the fact that we live in this metastability region. Okay, so all of that was based on uh, a Starobinsky-style uh, approach to this question. Okay, um, and I should also say the CERN group, um, uh, John Judice and uh, my buddy Matt McCulloch and um, and a postdoc there, Tevong Yu, have been investigating um, some new phenomena uh, that, that all, again, re resides on this Fokker-Planck equation. Um, they're calling this uh, self-organized criticality in cosmology. Um, so they just put out a paper about a week ago. It seems really interesting. Um, I haven't studied it yet. But uh, anyway, all of this just to say that there's a lot of use and application of this formalism uh, in phenomenology. Are you, are you gonna are you gonna <clears throat> say more about the 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 noise term or the 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 pink term? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna tell you where all this comes. Pretty intuitive, but the other, but that one is pretty a little opaque. If you haven't, yeah, give me give me a few slides and then yeah. um and then and sure. then jump in. Um, I think I forgot to say, and it, I don't think I have to say it this to y'all, but please interrupt me. Uh, uh, as um, the more interruptions, the better. Um. Okay, so uh, Starobinsky gave us this nice picture of this noise and this uh, drift, okay? Um, but if you read Starobinsky's paper, you, uh, I think you'll be impressed. It's a really nice paper, but then you'll also be left wondering, you know, is this a systematic approach? How do we actually correct this, okay? And that's really uh, largely the focus of this talk is I wanna introduce an effective field theory that's going to allow us to systematically correct uh, this form formalism of stochastic inflation. Okay, um, so here's a basic outline for what I'm going to tell you. Okay, um, I want to connect this picture that I drew to an effective field theory description. Okay, so that's going to be the the main purpose of my talk is to explain uh, this uh, equivalence. Okay, and in particular, I want to show that stochastic inflation is equivalent to an RG flow in a in exactly the standard sense uh, within the effective field theory, okay? And so 
Uh, the path we're going to take is first, um, where I'll try to address uh, the questions Marcus was asking, I just want to tell you about stochastic inflation generally, and I want to tell you what kind of corrections we expect. So I want to organize uh, the, your expectations for what we're going to calculate. Then I'll introduce the um, soft to sitter effective theory. This is um, an effective theory that Dan and I wrote down uh, last summer. Um, and uh, and I'll describe it in some detail and, and, um, and sort of make connections to uh, things you know about other effective field theories. I'll then use that to turn to the specific question of what happens for light scalar fields in de Sitter space time. Um, then I'll quickly run through uh, the systematic matching and running calculation that we've done that'll be presented in the forthcoming paper. And then I'll conclude uh, with some outline. Okay, so let's talk about stochastic inflation. Um, so I already showed you this equation. Okay, we have this so-called noise and so-called drift term. And um, this is not necessarily the question we ask in phenomenology, but for this talk, I'm going to ask um, a bit of a more formal question, which is I want to investigate corrections around this fixed point solution, where I just say I have no time dependence. Okay, so the probability distribution uh, evolves to some fixed point, and I can just solve the right hand side of this equation equals zero. And it's not too hard to do that. You just integrate basically. And where you land is this equi equilibrium probability distribution, which is an exponential that depends on the potential. Okay. Um, so where does that, where does this all come from? Um, you can actually think of it uh, in terms of a classic statistical physics problem. Okay. So if we assume that the fluctuations of the scalar field that's crossing the horizon are Markovian in the sense that they have no memory, which means that the time step now only depends on exactly the previous time step, but not the whole history of evolution, which is exactly the situation we're in, right? We just have this object which is fluctuating about whatever value it takes. Then uh, there's this classic statistical mechanics formalism uh, which basically takes the, this form. You can calculate the time dependence of the probability distribution by essentially integrating over all possible ways you can jump from some point phi prime to the point of interest phi. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. That gives you a term like this. And you also need to subtract from that all the ways your point phi of interest can change into uh, any phi prime not equal to phi. So that's uh, what this picture is trying to illustrate, and that's what we're subtracting here. Okay, so again, it's just this simple uh, assumption that you only need to know about the previous time step to calculate the next one, uh, gives you this really simple picture of uh, the evolution of the probability uh, function. So if we want to understand how, to, how this works systematically, uh, there's again a, a famous um, local expansion. It's local in the sense of this W object, that, which is controlling the transition rates. So if this W thing is Gaussian, say, a narrowly peaked Gaussian, that's what this Kramer's Moyle uh, expansion is sort of expanding about. Okay, So it's the, it's the corrections. If this thing is, is very peaked, it just tells you that you're most likely going to jump uh, close by. Okay, And when you do that, unsurprisingly, there's a Taylor expansion uh, you can write where the coefficients that appear here are just moments of this, uh, this hopping object, okay, this W thing. And if you further assume that these coefficients omega have a polynomial expansion, which is going to be the case in a perturbative de Sitter, uh, then it's, it just kind of falls out that the leading order stochastic inflation um, gets contributions from the potential, which are the omega-1 terms. So that's terms with no derivatives. Um, that should say equals 1. Um, so that's terms with no derivatives. Okay, And then we have uh, the omega-2 term. Um, sorry, I misspoke. The omega-1 term, that's the term with one derivative, right? The potential that appears in the, in the Starobinsky equation, it was the derivative of the potential. Um, and so that is captured by this omega-1. Uh, these are just the Wilson coefficients of the potential, okay, given here. 
And then omega-2, by sort of matching on to de Sitter space, gives you this uh, so-called quantum noise uh, terms, OK? And so yeah, so here's the point at which, um, so if you like, Marcus, this is the, um, it's basically just there is this um, non-trivial contribution at next order in this expansion, which you can trace back to, um, to capturing the fluctuations of the field as it crosses the horizon. And, um, and in particular, a uh, few things I could say is just that uh, you can think of this as uh, coming from the Gaussian noise because it's basically set by the variance, right? So these two derivatives here um, are, are essentially capturing the variance of this distribution where the width is set by Hubble. Um, and it's symmetric, right? It, it's like omega squared because it's the same probability to go in one direction versus the other. Um, or sorry, derivatives squared omega two. Um, so I don't know if that if that helps, but that's what. Uh, yeah, maybe can I ask? So this W is a function of two fields, and these are essentially constant fields, right? And uh, I sort of got that intuitively somehow W is something like a hopping rate or something like exactly. that intuitively exactly. that's what the role it's playing in the Fokker Planck equation but but so can you say mo a little bit more about how did you find how do you know what that is in i mean even just the interpretation the the, the fact that it depends on phi and phi is just one number which mm -hmm. seems like it's one number for all of De Sitter space. I don't know. The interpretation is just not not clear to me. I guess um, this is supposed to be for a given Hubble patch, and phi is the average value of phi. Good, or? good. Um, this this is very good. I've suppressed an index here, so phi is a is a function of wave number k vector. Okay. Ah, ah this is for each wave vector. So for In, each wave number. Ah, right, right, right. Yep. Okay. Um, and and I'm going to tell you, so Starobinsky's approach um, uh, has some elements of genius, right? Like there's you, you had to you had to have the insight, the physical picture, uh, at least I would have had to have his really nice physical picture in order to make any sense of what he was doing. Whereas what I want to show you here is, you know, I mean, you know me. Uh, I, I don't know how to be so clever. I just know if you hand me an effective field theory and it's well-defined, uh, I know how to approach the question systematically. And so what I want to do is I want to tell you how we get this kind of thing uh, from a much more systematic approach. But it does have this nice story behind it, which Starobinsky gave us. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. Um, all right. So. Um, now, when we go beyond this leading order, and I'll again, I'll come back to exactly how we do the counting uh, in orders in a moment, um, which will make it really clear uh, why those two terms were leading order. Um, so when we go beyond leading order, uh, there are basically a few effects, OK? We can get higher order terms in the potential. Uh, we can get higher order polynomial terms for a given derivative. But we can also get higher derivative terms, OK? And it's really going to be that next derivative term, the cubic derivative, which is the thing we're really excited about. That's going to give us this higher, higher order contribution to the noise or leading non-Gaussian contribution to the noise. Okay. And so in order to understand this systematically, we start from this equilibrium solution. Uh, oh, and now uh, critically, I'm going to, from here forward, I'm going to assume it's phi to the fourth theory from in the UV from here forward. Okay. So when you see lambdas, that's the phi to the fourth coupling. And if you're ever wondering what theory we're talking about, this is the one we're talking about. So when I take this formula I wrote a few slides ago, which is just solving that Fokker-Planck equation with the time derivative turned off, you see I plug in the potential here. okay, And this exponential basically has support when phi is of order h times lambda to the minus 1 quarter. okay. So the perturbative expansion is going to be an expansion where we're going to assume that the equilibrium solution has this power counting. And then we're going to uh, correct on top of that 
Okay, so every time I see a phi, I'm going to assume that it scales like this, and that's going to organize the perturbation theory for me. Is there a minus sign in the exponential, or it looks like it grows with phi? Oh, uh, yes, there is. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Very good. I was going to ask the same. I was going to yeah. ask the same thing. Very good, thank you. Um, yeah, that's just a typo. Um, great, and um, and so. Uh, in the perturbative expansion, again, there's it's a little the logic's a little bit circular here, but it's all self consistent. Um, so my claim is that these Wilson coefficients are going to go like higher and higher powers of lambda. That should be intuitive from standard EFT, right? I'm going to get a tower of interactions in the EFT coming from the phi to the fourth coupling. Uh, but I'm also uh, going to find by just explicit calculation that these omegas, which were the moments of that hopping distribution are going to go like powers of lambda to the n plus m. And again, that bears out in the, in the calculations in the effective theory. So if you'll bear with me and allow me uh, to assume that this is going to be the expansion, the way the, the lambda shows up in the perturbative expansion of these two objects, then I can systematically tell you what the terms are going to look like. Okay. So here is the leading order equation. It's just exactly the one I wrote before, Okay, where I've now plugged in my potential, remember it was the derivative of the potential that appeared here. And now the dot, dot, dots are just bringing down uh, the terms from the um, equation before it. Uh, it. Next to leading order, you see I get new corrections uh, to the two derivative term and I get higher order corrections to the potential terms. Um, and at next to next to leading order, I also get corrections to the stuff I already had before, but that's where this first appearance of a genuinely new phenomenon appears, namely the non-Gaussian noise, okay? And we can go through the exercise. It's just counting, using the, counting on the previous slide for these omegas or the Cs, and then uh, counting phi like one over lambda to the quarter. Um, okay, so this is, and notice leading order here goes like lambda to the one half, okay? Um, you can see that for many of these terms, but let's just look at this one. Phi goes like one over lambda to the one quarter and it's squared here. So that gives me lambda to the one half in the numerator. The same counting holds for all these terms. NLO goes like lambda and NLO is gonna go like lambda to the three halves, okay? So you'll see these weird powers showing up much later in the talk and that's where they're coming from. Can, can I ask a question? Because, uh, yeah. so I mean, I, I, I think I got that, okay, you're expanding around this quote unquote equilibrium you know, configuration. And I can think of that as an ansatz. But I guess I, I still don't really understand the Ws or equivalently the omegas, mm -hmm. what they sort of physically are. I don't really understand that well. So I mean, so one way to ask the question is, you know, how do you power count those? I mean, they appear in these formulas. So yes. there's implicitly some assumption about how big they are, I don't, don't really understand even what they are, to be honest. So anything you could say about that would be appreciated. Good. So, um, so here I'm just declaring by fiat, this is what is going to come out of explicit calculation. Okay. Um, so you need to oh, know, okay. and, um, and the way, so, uh, so to a very comes, good prop. Yeah, go ahead. To a very good approximation, uh, or let me put it this way, a free scalar field into sitter has Gaussian fluctuations in a scale invariant power spectrum, okay? So that's where the intuition that the leading effect should be Gaussian comes from, is because the free field into sitter just gives you Gaussian fluctuations. The modes as they cross the horizon, you can calculate it's a Henkel function, but right. you, know, you can actually calculate all this very explicitly. Um, so the... Um, where this comes from, I think, is not at all intuitive. It just that's that's going to bear out by direct calculation. Um, but uh, but you can imagine it's not so surprising that um, that there will be perturbative corrections to the Gaussian solution or to the Gaussian approximation proportional to lambda. Okay, um, and then exactly this counting requires you to understand the loop structure and so on. And I'll. As we go through the talk, I hope to give you more insight into that. But, um, okay. but at this stage, I haven't justified that for you. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So um, let's get into uh, the effective theory we're going to use to actually calculate these things. 
Um, and I'll highlight the papers Dan and I from uh, middle of last year. Okay, so here's the basic idea is we're interested in the long wavelength limit, okay? Um, and so uh, De Sitter provides us with a natural ruler, namely the horizon. So what we wanna do is we wanna power count in the standard EFT sense, continuum EFT sense, where the limit we're interested in is the physical momentum much, much smaller than the Hubble horizon, okay? Uh, so UV modes have K over A much, much bigger than H, and IR modes have K over A much, much less than H. Um, and all we're gonna do is we're gonna follow um, essentially an HQET-like rule book, and we're going to assume this is a good power counting parameter. We're gonna follow our nose, and we're gonna derive an effective field to reaction from the, starting, by, starting with the UV theory, okay? Um, and the reason that this is uh, interesting, even just on the face of it, is that actual calculations of correlators into sitter space, let me emphasize, um, we're talking about the in informalism here. So we're, we're calculating in in correlation functions. Those are relevant because what we want to do is we want to project the physics onto a horizon at future infinity and understand the correlations of the fields where we actually make measurements, right? Um, so this is relevant for inflation or for this question we're asking here about the fluctuations of a scalar field into sitter. And when you actually do this, um, it's, I, I don't know if you all know, it's actually Weinberg wrote, uh, wrote the seminal paper on this subject, big surprise. So he's the one who, um, who really worked out this formalism and, uh, and taught us how to do these calculations. And, um, but when you do it, what you find is you're treating time and space independently. In fact, when you actually do these calculations, you integrate over time and you work with wave number. So you actually Fourier transform in space, but you leave time and as time because you want to do ultimately these projections uh, onto the future infinity horizon. And when you do that, the time and space integrals are totally mixed up. It's not at all obvious what's going on. It's actually very hard to even tell what a UV divergence is versus an IR divergence. Um, not to mention that all full theory calculations use hard cutoffs, which break symmetries, okay? So, um, well, especially to a friendly audience, I'll just say uh, the subject's a mess and it's very difficult to tell what's going on, even for someone like Dan, who's been doing this um, professionally for his entire career, basically. Um, so when I asked Dan my stupid questions about what kind of logarithms do you find when you do QFT and De Sitter, um, and you know, what do, what's the difference between a UV and an IR divergence, he didn't have any good answers for me at the time, okay? Well, okay, that's not true. He had plenty of answers, but uh, lots of confusing, there are lots of confusions he pointed out, okay? So that led us to, uh, to, to try to figure this out, to try to disentangle these things. And where we landed uh, is what we call the soft to sitter effective theory. Uh, actually, it's um, uh, Matt Baumgart and Raman Sundram named this for us. So they've been thinking about this problem too. They've been focused on stochastic inflation. They have a beautiful formalism for understanding, again, how to get an RG description. Uh, their paper, uh, I think of their paper as being like the perturbative QCD version of what we've done. Um, so uh, like my colleague, Dave Soper is very good at just staring at Feynman integrals and recognizing patterns of logarithms. That's effectively what Matt and Raman did. And at the end of their paper, they said, boy, it would be nice if an effective field theory description of this existed, which would just make all of this systematic. And Dan and I were pretty far along when we read that line. Oh, and they called it the soft to sitter effective theory. And when Dan and I read that line, we said, oh, thank you. You named what we were doing. Um, so uh, in our paper, I won't have time to tell you about all of this, but in our paper, um, we basically have four uh, uh, slogans, if you like, uh, four things that we were able to uh, demonstrate. Um, we calculated, and I'm happy to chat about this afterwards in more detail. I have some backup slides. We calculated, uh, showed that correlators for massive scalars um, are just dominated by relevant physics. They all fall off exponentially. Um, and that's simply due to power counting in the effective field theory. We discussed uh, Starobinsky's stochastic inflation, which is just resumming a tower of marginal operators using RG. Um, so I'll make a point about going from the massive to the massless limit in this talk. Uh, what I won't talk about here is applications to inflation. So you can use the same formalism 
to show that uh, the fluctuations of the metric uh, freeze out at super horizon scales, which of course is a very famous aspect of inflationary theory, right? This is a part of the cartoon we say is that we have quantum fluctuations get stretched out beyond horizon and become classical and static. Uh, that, that story is completely beautiful in the SDSET. You can see literally, and I'll show you a little bit of this, but you see literally the quantum fluctuations become classical as you go from the full theory fields to the EFTs fields. Um, and then we even have some uh, vague thoughts about eternal inflation. Namely, we see that in the eternally inflating regime, um, there's a tower of relevant operators that appear, which tell you that uh, you're going to need to resolve the, the sort of uh, free theory equations of motion. Um, and that at least tr tells us that there's something that triggers a new phase. OK, so why are we talking about EFT? I already said this. There's a natural ruler. And now I'm going to switch uh, my coordinate system. So I'm going to treat my cutoff as being AH. OK, so you'll see AH is all over the place. Um, so I'm going to work with co-moving coordinates instead of the physical coordinates. And again, we're just going to take this limit, k much, much less than AH. And there's a large separation of scales here because we're in the long wavelength limit. Um, and I said all of this, this is in a little bit more technical language. But what I'm going to do is isolate the propagating degrees of freedom. I'll write down a quadratic action for you. And I'll discuss what symmetries are, are uh, important. And then I'll tell you about a power counting scheme, um, which is effectively just dimensional analysis, as usual. Uh, I'll tell you a, a little bit about the regulator that we invented that uh, sort of emerges naturally in the SDSET um, that's very DIMREG like, uh, but and has all the features of DIMREG. It doesn't break symmetries. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, actually how to calculate an RG, um, which can sum the full theory IR logs, right? So we're going to use the standard trick where we're going to go from a UV theory that has IR divergences to an EFT that has UV divergences, where those divergences are the same, have the same origin. But since they're UV divergences in the EFT, that means we can run the program of RG to sum them. Um, OK, let me skip this. OK, so, um, so now let's start to actually get into it. So let's take our full theory field phi, and uh, let's break it into a soft mode and a hard mode. OK, and then we're just going to integrate out the hard mode. And that's going to give us a local operator expansion. Um, so we're going to work in DS space. OK, so we just have a standard FRW type metric. OK, um, you'll see none of this is actually important, but just I wanted to find some notation. You'll see I have this T underline thing. We have some fancier character in the papers. Um, it's just rescaled time. Uh, it's dimensionless. And actually, this rescaling you know, it's again one of these simple things where you do this rescaling, and all of a sudden, all the dimensional analysis makes sense. Okay, um, and sometimes in complicated formulas, I'll need to use conformal time, uh, which is just related to this uh, t underline thing like this. Okay, so here's what the actions look like. So the full theory uh, action looks very familiar. Okay, it's um, this is coming from the the square root of the metric. Okay, square root of minus g. We have scalar fields with gravitational covariant derivatives. We got a mass, and we got a quartic coupling for phi. Okay, and the claim is that when you match this onto the soft to sitter effective theory, you get a theory that's expressed in terms of two modes. I'll define these in a moment. Okay, has a very simple action that's a uh, uh, first order in time. Okay, so these are real fields, and uh, with this simple first order action, and then the um, interaction structure takes this form where there's, this is the leading interaction structure, I should say. There's one factor of this phi minus and then n factors of this phi plus. Okay. And these, are, I'll, I'll tell you about the power counting in a moment, but um, the power counting is going to tell us that these are the leading interactions. So, where did this phi plus and phi minus field come from? We start with just the free field equation of motion into sitter. OK, that looks like this. And you can solve this thing. And in the soft limit, so if you just solve it uh, directly, you get Hankel functions. But if you take the soft limit, which means just setting this to 0, it's very easy to solve this equation. Um, and you find just these scaling solutions that this thing we're calling phi sub s, the solution in the soft limit, has this time dependence 
where there's two solutions uh, times some field that's independent of time uh, var phi sub s. Okay. And sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. How is that time dependent? Is there some typo in there? You just have a h. Yeah. Yeah. Because a is time dependent. So all my time. Oh, dependent okay. The time, a is your clock. I got a it. is the scale factor. Exactly. Right. So uh, thank you. I should have said that. Uh, all um, once we all physical results only depend on a h. Um, yeah. Exactly. And um, and so then uh, the so we have these two solutions. Okay. Uh, you'll see sometimes I'll use alpha and beta, okay? Uh, but the basic idea is that the mass appears in this new coefficient or in this alpha and beta choice, okay? And here we're going to be interested in the massless limit, which is the limit that alpha goes to zero or nu goes to three halves, okay? Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Please, please. Uh, in the soft limit, I guess you'll assume the mass is large. I, I mean, you neglect the k square term, but you keep the m square term. So yeah, that's right. So are you assuming m square is larger than k square divided by a square? Um. So uh, I'm just trying to to understand. In the soft limit, you seem like you 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 throw away the k square term, but you keep the m square term, right? That's right. So um. Yeah, so here I'm interested in, uh, if you like, I want to do an expansion. Uh, and so, so this formula gets corrections of order k squared over h, a h squared. Actually, it gets logarithmic corrections as well. Um, but really, my power counting truncation is at this stage, OK? So this is the leading order in, in terms of the power counting expansion. OK, OK, got yeah. it. Yeah, so the the. The mass is just coming along for the ride, if you like. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Great. Okay. So we're going to identify these two solutions um, in the cosmology literature. They call these the growing and the decaying mode, which is annoying because they both decay. But the growing mode decays slower than the decaying mode. Okay. So it's this phi plus object, which is the thing that persists in principle to uh, to late times. The decaying mode plays no role in observables because it decays faster. And so all of the physics of interest um, is uh, contained by looking at correlators of the growing mode. And that's going to be very convenient for us because we're going to be able to do field redefinitions of the decaying mode to get rid of all kinds of garbage and get a nice, simple, effective theory that's quite easy to use. Um, so we're going we're gonna to play all the standard games, um, but you'll see that uh, it's going to be critical that we're able to redefine the decaying mode at will, because ultimately here, since we're calculating in in correlators, um, there uh, we could we could have a conversation about schemes and and the fact that these things are not themselves actually physical because they're correlators. And so if I do a field redefinition on var phi plus, I change the physics. Okay, so we need to be careful. Um, thankfully, because of this fact. We can do whatever we want with the decaying mode, and we'll make a lot of money by playing around with it. Okay. So ultimately, the game is this is a standard multi-mode expansion for an EFT. I'm going to take the full theory. I'm going to plug in this soft field where I have just pulled out the leading time dependence. Okay, for the growing mode and the decaying mode. Here's this alpha and beta, which were those two parameters that depended on the mass, and this is uh, the sort of tree level, the leading. Um, matching between the full theory field and the soft limit and the effective field theory. Um, and what's phenomenal about this is that we factorized out the time dependence. So at least at tree level in all our expressions, time dependence and k dependence, mode dependence, are completely factorized. Remember, these things are functions of k, OK? And that makes all of these questions about where divergence is coming from and what's going on in the integrals um, much easier to interpret. Sorry, can I just ask? So, uh, so, so alpha and beta are independent of k. Correct. Yeah, they're they're just um, they're just set by the mass through this formula. Right, and that's because you've it, the, the k independence is because you've neglected that middle term in your top equation, right? The k in de independence. Exactly. Exactly. Right, and then um, okay. 
So we're going to reintroduce all of the K over AH dependence um, through power counting, right? That's our power rate. counting. Parameter. Right. Okay. Um, can you go? Can you go forward again to just yep. where you were? Just were. So um, uh, I'm just trying to think of an. Is there a? Is there an analog that I would be familiar with with this e equation that phi s equals this is a solution. I understand this is the solution when you neglect that term, right? Mm -hmm. It is just the answer. So, okay. But yeah. now you're going to somehow plug this into your EFT. Is there, is there an example, a familiar example of this that I should be thinking Absolutely. of? Yeah, HQET, right? So in HQET, we take the non-relativistic limit for the field. We do exactly the same thing. We identify, we break our full theory mo field into two modes, mm -hmm. a soft mode and a hard mode, okay? The right. soft mode is the non-relativistic limit. And then we include velocity dependent corrections as operators, as higher and higher dimension operators in the effective Lagrangian. Right, and here are the, but here the new ingredient is that you, your background really is time dependence and you, so your, your, your leading mode has got some time dependence in it. It's not That's just right. the HQET, you're just factoring out uh, certain fluctuations in a static, Everything is static. Uh, the background is static, at least. Right. 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 Yes. Okay. You can Although, also sorry, think about here, ADS. Let, me, let, me, let me just say here, you should also think about the background as static, right? In this way, Hubble is fixed. Okay. So there is right. time dependence. The modes are crossing the horizon, right? But the background itself is fixed. Okay, but that, that's sort of a choice of frame or something, right? That's kind of like Heisenberg picture versus Schrodinger picture or something because there are like, the, the situation is time dependent, right? The physical yes. situation, yes. as you said, modes are crossing the horizon, so. Yes. Sorry, John, I interrupted you. You can also think about ADS CFT where instead of time dependence, you would have a Z dependence and you find the two solutions and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, right, right. So something like, yeah, something like effective theory and long distance theory. By the way, has that been worked out systematically? The long, you know, this is sort of like, uh, you know, if you if you allow in an anti desider once you uh, go into the regime where, you know, the warp factor is incredibly important, you know, you you lose most degrees of freedom, but maybe there's something left over if you add some. Has that been worked out? Is anything? Um, so so some aspects of this are definitely play a role because um, you know what John was mentioning, right? There's a whole renormalization group uh, uh, approach to understanding um, that connection, right? You can evolve yourself in the z direction using an RG. Um, as right. far as being writing down the continuum EFT, I don't think so. It's something that Dan has talked about uh, exploring, I think, uh, with some with some other folks. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've never seen uh, I've never seen something that looks that that sort of follows the rules uh, the way we like them um, in the in just you know in doing this exactly this kind of mode expansion. Uh, and really deriving a continuum EFT. It might exist, but uh, I'm just not aware of it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, if you do so, it, so you again, get just... particles. That's what on particles <laughs> okay. are. Can I, so let me just, I'm just still sort of absorbing this. So yeah. in this, in this, 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 your, your big equation at the, at the bottom here, I should think of like if phi plus and phi minus are constants, this is like the, this is the leading order solution where I neglect the K dependence. And now these phi plus and phi minus are gonna become sort of slowly varying. That the corrections on top of that, is that a correct That's picture right. to have? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit about um, quantizing this theory, uh, in part because as I alluded to before this, um, this is a really nice part of the story for understanding uh, inflation. So in the full theory, it's well known how to quantize these fields, okay? You solve that equation of motion, including the K dependence uh, for the mode functions, 
Those are the bunch Davies solutions. Okay, I've written them explicitly here. This thing is the Henkel function. Okay, and note it depends on k and conformal time tau. Um, and these fields, the creation and annihilation operators here, have a standard canonical commutation relation. Okay, so this is literally the quantum scalar field in a de Sitter background uh, takes this form. Okay, this is of course schematic. There's an integral here over um, over three three space uh, or three momenta, excuse me, or momentum space. So um, now you can take that formula and you can just Taylor expand in the small k tau limit. That's the long wavelength limit. And when you do that, you notice this combination here I've highlighted of creation and annihilation operators appear in front of a common prefactor. So this phi plus bar, this is the mode function for phi plus, is the famous scale invariant power spectrum. The two point function goes like one over k cubed in the massless limit where alpha goes to zero. Okay, so that's the scale invariant power spectrum we all know and love from inflation. Phi minus has slightly different scaling. It depends on beta, okay? But the point here is that this change of variables from A's to what we'll call A tilde and B tilde is just a Bogolyubov transformation, okay? And when we take the commutation relations for the original creation and annihilation operators, and we just work through the algebra, what we find, so this is the create the annihilation operator acting on the vacuum uh, gives you zero, okay? We're using that here. And we find that you end up with an expectation value of these objects, these new creation and annihilation operators uh, are simply given by a delta function, okay? So this is the condition for a Gaussian classical spectrum. Um, the things are uncorrelated and just fluctuating, okay? And that gives you with this one over k cubed, that gives you the classic scale invariant prediction, uh, this one, the classic scale invariant prediction for inflation in the massless limit, okay? And, and by the way, this alpha, okay, I'm being a little fast and loose here. Of course, I'm not talking about the inflaton, I'm talking about a scalar field, but roughly speaking, you know, the small corrections to the one over k cubed, right, which come from slow roll are essentially being tracked by this alpha, okay? So we actually Sorry. see that we get stochastic random variables in the long wavelength limit from the fundamental quantum fluctuations. Do, do you really mean A, A, and B, B, and not A bar, A dagger A, and B dagger B? Uh, yes, I do mean A, A, and B, B. Um, so they're real modes uh, is a part of the, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a little bit. Um, so that, that means, So it's just calculating the two-point function. So the way this works, if I take the two-point function of the full fields, okay, they are one over k to the three halves times this a tilde thingy, okay, and I get two factors of one over k. I I can write on this. I get uh, so if I take phi plus phi plus, okay, roughly I get one over k q three halves one over k prime to the three halves times this a tilde of k prime a tilde of k, right? That gives me the delta function and that gives me one over k cubed for the two point function. Why don't you have a daggers? Uh, you do, you do. They just, um, so I'm, again, I'm being kind of fast, but um, the a tilde and a dagger tildes commute, okay? And the, um, and the a dagger contributions uh, vanish, they give you zero. Oh, and above the the tilde guys, they they literally commute. These are not the canonical no. relations, which are this is okay. So I I missed that somehow. Yeah, yeah. These are these are like classical stochastic random variables now. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And for this, yeah, but they really are operators on some Hilbert space. Um. Yeah, so they feed into, uh, I don't know how to think about this in, I don't know the answer to that question exactly. Um, the way these calculations are done in this in informalism, um, there's a, um, essentially there's an iterative commutator structure that looks a lot like WIC contractions. And the rule is when you contract two phi's, you use, you use this formula. 
So that's like the, the analog of what we do when we do wit contractions is basically any pair of phi's, at least at leading order, gives you, um, gives you one over k cubed times a delta function. And you just do all possible contractions uh, weighted by uh, the appropriate stuff in the in informalism. Because I mean, somehow a few, few lines back, you started off with just literally uh, canonical quantization, right? I mean, you just Correct. have some complete set of modes you have Correct. some creation yeah, annihilation yeah. operators. And then you said the words bugaloo above transformation. And so I just thought that these A tildes are gonna be some complete set of modes. And usually bugaloo above transformations, the new creation and annihilation operators are also canonical. So I'm a little yeah. bit- So that's annoying. a difference here and, and maybe um, actually, when I the last time I gave this talk, uh, Hitoshi Moriyama was in the audience, and he he similarly didn't like my use of the word book all the above here. <laughs> so okay. maybe that's not all I mean, right? Is you can it's just algebraic. I can identify this combination of creation and annihilation operator has the same coefficient, and we just relabel yeah. that as this a tilde right. thing and b tilde thing. Operationally, that's all. We're but doing. they end up. It's but you can see about... that they're Hermitian operators. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 they and you, I trust you. You know, you check you check their commutation relation, and yes. they commute. So somehow, in this leading approximation, it's like they it's this is like somehow the classicality or something that you end exactly. up with exactly an exactly instead right. of commuting things rather than canonical. The, there there are corrections that are coming later that have the non commutative stuff, but this is like the classical limit. Somehow. Exactly. That's exactly right. the right interpretation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. Um, so good. I said all of this. Let me, because uh, we are very, very much out of time already. Um, okay. So um, yeah. Can you give me a, a sort of how much time do I have left? Yeah. Look. You need to finish by four o'clock. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think maybe what we should do is uh, if, if uh, you know, not everybody may want to stay to the very end, bloody end. So maybe if you could try to do a, come to a, a stopping point in, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, something like that. And then we can just continue for the people who, I would definitely be interested in staying on, but other people may have things they need to go to. Sure. Um... Yeah, since you have a Nima style slide. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so oof. Um, let me, okay, I tell you what, I'm just gonna, I'll skip a slide or two and um, yeah, I'll try to finish. I'll try to at least get to the punchline, show all the slides and then we can, uh, we can go backwards and unpack some stuff. Um, Okay, so to define the soft sitter effective theory, okay, I've told you a lot about the degrees of freedom. I've told you what the power counting is. I haven't told you anything about the symmetries. Uh, so we inherit space-time symmetry, uh, and there's a reparameterization symmetry, just like in heavy quark effective theory, because we've split the mode into these multiple modes, and the way that we did that was arbitrary, and that gives us a reparameterization invariance um, that, again, we can use to simplify things and uh, and sort of beautify the action, okay? And then uh, maybe uh, let's come back to this one. This one will generate a lot of questions. This is the new ingredient. This is the thing I, I'm personally most proud of is the insight that there's this extra thing you need to specify to define the EFT, which is um, the initial conditions. So when we integrate out uh, the, um, the modes as they cross the horizon, basically we have, we can, we have to specify uh, there's a time independent piece that you see when you match, and we have to specify that time independent piece uh, as a correlator. So we have a two point function with corrections, we have a four point function with corrections, and so on. Um, and, and that I think kind of gets at some of the questions you were asking, Marcus, too, is that some of that's encoded in the initial conditions. Um, so let's come back to that one. It's a very cool idea. Um, but let me rush through and just tell you a little bit about the interaction structure. So, as I promised, um, so the power counting, oh, did I ever, huh, you know what? I may not have had it explicit anywhere. Um, the power counting is actually, it's very simple to see, um, 
in a formula like this one, okay, um, the, the power counting scales with AH, okay? So this thing uh, power counts as order one, and this power counts as power counting parameter to the alpha to compensate the power counting of AH to the minus alpha. Similarly, this power counts like the power counting parameter to the beta, okay? Uh, and again, you see that in the standard way by looking at the action and insisting that the action power count is order one. So with that power counting, we can organize the interactions. Um, so in the small alpha limit, the leading interaction is just polynomials of far phi plus. In fact, those would look uh, marginal from the point of view of our power counting, but we can remove those with a very definition on var phi minus, okay? So that tells us uh, what the leading interactions, or, or that lets us organize into relevant, marginal, and irrelevant, okay? Just based on the number of phi pluses and phi minuses, okay? Um, and um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm rushing, so let me just go to the light scalar limit where alpha goes to zero. So now when alpha goes to zero, we can recognize this uh, set of interactions that I wrote on an early slide where I'm allowed any number of phi pluses and one phi minus, that's gonna power count like AH to the one minus N times alpha. But as I take alpha to the zero, alpha to zero, there's just, this goes away and everything power counts like order one. Um, Sorry, these lambdas are power counting, uh, not phi to the fourth, okay? And so the, um, good. So I've identified that in the massless limit, there are a tower of interactions that become marginal. And so I should presumably allow myself to have operator mixing since they have the same dimension. And in fact, the claim is that the RG evolution that governs that operator mixing is exactly equivalent to the Starobinsky picture of stochastic inflation, okay? So um, one important thing is just my equations of motion at tree level, including this tower of interactions look like this. This is gonna show up in the Starobinsky formula in a minute. Uh, let me skip this. We have a way of regulating integrals. It's really cool. We can come back to it. Um, so now, there's one last piece of this, which is that uh, composite operators built out of phi plus to the n all also scale like order one, okay? So again, this is the same statement said a slightly differently, but that tells us that composite operators are gonna mix under RG. And in particular, if I take some composite operator and I tie two legs together, the way I do that is I integrate over these mode functions, okay? So I get one over this is the one over k cubed, right? And I just integrate because I've tied those together. Uh, so I integrate over the unknown momentum there. And this gives me a mixing between the on operator and the on minus two operator that's proportional to something that diverges like a log, okay? D3p over p cubed and the alpha goes to zero limit. And in particular, if I use the standard tricks from continuum EFT, namely, this is a scaleless integral, but if I put in an IR regulator, I can isolate the log divergence, okay? I'm using, okay, I should have maybe not skipped that slide, but here's where alpha is my regulator parameter, okay? So just like DIMREG, I have one of our alphas and the alpha goes to zero limit and corresponding log AHs, which are what I wanna sum, okay? Um, so it's exactly this kind of stuff that gives me an RG, a non-trivial RG mixing ON with ON minus two. Okay, so here's what Starobinsky inflation looks like uh, at leading order. So the time dependence of this operator mixing is given by the tree level contribution from the potential itself that just came from taking the equations of motion plus this operator mixing term. And if you just take this formula and you convert it into something in terms of a probability distribution P like this, you get the Fokker-Planck equation uh, that Starobinsky wrote down, okay? And so there's lots to unpack here. I apologize for rushing, but um, we have instead, uh, so this is called dynamical RG. 
okay, where our RG scale is actually summing time. So it's giving us a differential equation in time. That's because our logs are logs of AH, okay? So they have time dependence in them. So we're basically by the RG is actually tracking the time dependence because it's tracking logs of AH, okay? So, um, hey, I'm gonna pull this off. Let me just flash a bunch of pictures at you and then uh, we'll just uh, open this up for discussion. I'll go back and, and talk through things slower. So we do matching, okay? There's tree level matching. We also have to match these initial conditions. Uh, at one loop, we find a perturbative correction to this alpha, okay? Comes from a diagram like this. There's also these one loop corrections. This gives us a, a perturbative correction to the Wilson coefficient in the potential in the EFT. And we had to comp compute this six point function contribution to the initial conditions. And finally, in order to get the operator mixing, we take all of these matching pieces and we tie them together by essentially creating composite operators by tying two legs together, okay? So this is a sort of Feynman diagram, uh, which is basically taking this integrating over P, okay? And that gives us a local operator evaluated at X equals zero. Um, and you can just calculate and you get mode functions times yeah, uh, so these, these are the mode functions, not the probability. And, uh, and you get these one over alpha corrections and you get, um, so that this is again, removed by a counter term, this is what you sum using the RG. At NNLO, we get a uh, contribution that looks like this, okay? Which is we take legs of the six point function and tie them together. But we also get this two loop diagram where we take the four point function and we tie two legs, two of these legs together. And that gives us the sunset like loop, okay? And this is actually the thing that's responsible for the new effect. Phi cubed operator gen is, gets converted into that three derivative term I told you about at the beginning of the talk. So here's what the whole thing looks like with all these corrections. This is all made explicit, but actually you can do our final field redefinition uh, where you can redefine phi plus in order to arrive at this beautiful, simple form of the NNLO Starobinsky equation. So um, let me box it permanently. The, uh, so we get the drift, the noise, and now this new non-Gaussian contribution to the noise where everything can be re-expressed in terms of lambda effective, which looks like this. Uh, and, and V effective is just a polynomial in, uh, this is V effective prime. God, there's too many typos here. It's a polynomial in um, the uh, var phi plus field. And we've checked, this um, actually is a scheme independent to this order uh, in using the standard way, you know, you take the coupling and you vary it a little bit and you can see that all higher order corrections would be pushed um, to, to the next order term. So at N and NLO, we would have to worry about scheme, but at N NLO, we're safe from all those complications and we could just write this very beautiful form of the equation where you know a year of hard work was to get 192 here, okay? Um, so finally, uh, I wanna just say that, um, you know, you should be, I've only sketched it for you, of course, but you should be quite impressed that it works. In particular, uh, this thing I'll tell you more about with matching, where you have to specify a contribution to initial conditions. We only showed that at tree level in the last paper. And here we've really done an honest one loop calculation. And, um, and so everything that we thought was going to hold at quantum level in the previous work uh, continues to hold. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, this is really a uh, strong evidence that this is a, um, a well-defined effective field theory at the quantum level. And in our paper, we're then gonna take that equation that I boxed for you, and we have calculations of the equilibrium uh, solution corrected to order lambda to the three halves, and also the so-called relaxation eigenvalues, which are just the actually solving the time dependence around the, the equilibrium solution so you can do that numerically. That's something that's been done in the literature. So we are providing, uh, that's a physical uh, result of this calculation. 
And we've now computed the low-lying relaxation to eigenvalues to order lambda to the three halves. Um, and there's tons of future stuff. Dan told, tells me we have to rush this paper out because he's got the next project already lined up. Uh, we're going to apply this to inflationary correlators and do a very similar calculation where uh, a lot of these issues of scheme are, um, are not relevant because there are more symmetries. Um, there are applications to Fino. I mentioned this recent thing that came out of CERN. I'm really interested to understand the connection to our work and just exploring the soft sitter effective theory in general. Um, you know, it's a new effective field theory. So uh, I'm sure there's tons of uh, cool corners to be worked out and things to explore. Um, okay, so that was uh, <laughs> uh, very quick, but um, I can back up now uh, and, uh, and go through it as, in as much detail as, as y'all have the patience for. Well, let's let's thank Tim, uh, and then we can stick around and talk more. So, questions from not John or Marcus? Can I comment on more about the application to Fino? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think do he's I want asking to you to comment? Oh, um, yeah. So. Um, very good. I have a variety of ideas here. Uh, one thing is um, I want to, uh, like I said, I just haven't had a chance to study this paper that, um, that came out of the CERN group recently. Um, for all I know, the, the small corrections that were calculating play no role there, but um, maybe in the, as you take the lambda coupling to be large, you know, in the sort of semi-perturbative regime, you might find new phases of uh, the kind of physics that they were exploring. So that's something I wanted to think about. There's also, um, you know, in all, in, in, for example, something like the Relaxion, uh, I think there hasn't really been a careful job of understanding the phenomenology of the Relaxion, the cosmology, um, really doing uh, um, an honest calculation. And I think we have the tools to be able to do that. So we could plug the Relaxion potential into this framework, uh, even just the tree level framework, frankly, but for soft to effective theory and actually understand um, in uh, without tildes, we could actually calculate, I think, a lot of the effects that they rely on, uh, both in that model and that's inflating to the weak scale model and other models like that. Um, and, um, and then I think there's also interesting stuff with like multi-field models and understanding, um, now that we understand how to compute corrections, uh, you know, there's sort of a model building question. Can you find models where these corrections are large and actually change the phenomenology? Um, and that's something I don't have. Uh, there are examples of UV theories in literature that do that kind of thing. Taking those, taking the soft limit, understanding how it maps onto this, I think would be very interesting. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of things uh, that, that I, at least at this point, have in mind. Um, but I think the first thing we're going to do is is this, um, uh, because we can now calculate the um, the corrected uh, inflationary correlator. Um, so I, I think the idea is going to be we're going to calculate the three point correlator, uh, including these corrections uh, in the long wavelength limit, um, and write that down for the first time. Um, yeah, that would be good. This uh, relates to the nine Gaussianity, I assume. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it, it, I think it'll give us some insight into um, into that. It, it, we're going to calculate like the three point function. Um, okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah.